Good morning from Hudson Valley, New York. What a beautiful drive up here from Manhattan. It was wonderful to get out of the city traffic and visiting with Dr. Laura Nizowitz. Oh, I'm not doctor, sorry. She's a doctor to me. Um, she's not a sexologist either, but, <laughs> but she is a psychologist and is a very interesting um, friend and colleague and has traveled the world. Um, we've had some very interesting discussions and that's why I thought it was terrific to bring her on today. We had the opportunity to talk about multiple things going on in the world today, everything from running a practice to marketing to what doctors and psychologists and family therapists are taught, social workers, social workers are taught when it comes to marketing your practice, dealing with issues for men, women, and couples, and what we're dealing with day to day with looking good and feeling good about yourself. So Laura is here to give us her expert opinion. Uh, Laura, we will be having questions. Um, if you have tuned into Facebook Live every Wednesday at one o'clock, you can go on to beautifulforever.com and see all of our past Facebook Live shows. And I welcome all comments and all questions. We will get to some of the questions today. And if we don't, we will follow up after today. And I look forward to continuing um, here with Dr. Well, Laura. I keep calling her Laura Nizowitz. <laughs> and um, you could just call me Laura. Okay, we'll just call her Laura for today. And um, I like to make sure the position of the camera is right because Laura looks beautiful and will be beautiful forever. I know that inside <laughs> and out. Um, so I guess today, Laura, when we talk about the psychology of couples, of women, of life, I know you often bring in. Uh, when we talk and we laugh about um, fairy tales and stories and you know people looking in the mirror and how they're feeling about themselves. Does a little bit of a facelift or a Botox really make somebody feel good inside? What's really going on? There's a lot of psychology behind all of that. There are things that have been written in our industry in the aesthetic market. Um, you know, get Botox, get a facelift. It'll change your personality. We all know that's not true. It can give you a jolt. Um, you can look in the mirror and feel better about yourself. But really, internally, are you feeling better about yourself? And how do we deal in the industry and the practices day to day with with women and men and couples um, about how they're feeling about themselves? Um, and you know, I guess growing up in the fashion business, my dad was in the garment center, my mother was in the accessory and jewelry business, and oh, I was didn't know this. <laughs> And we're both born in Brooklyn, we know that. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, there's so, so to me, you know, aesthetics and beauty and dressing and makeup, it's just a part of my daily life and my world. And it's um, fun to dress up. It is fun. Um, and, you know, will I leave the house without makeup? Sometimes it's rare. Always have my sunblock on. but <laughs> And my lipstick. Um, but the truth is that, you know, we're laughing about it, but there's a lot of people out there where it really is a situation of which they need somebody like you to give them advice and they come to you on a weekly basis and it it could be fatal in some cases. So I guess I want you to just talk to the audience a little bit about the way you view um, people and how they look in the mirror, how they feel about themselves and is the Botox and the facelift really the answer and how do we deal in the practice with people coming in who are unhappy with themselves thinking that we're the answer. We're going to make them up, give them new makeup, give them a new face. Is that really what's going to help them to be a better person or a happier person? You know, we, we talked earlier about Cinderella. It's one yeah. of my favorite fantasies. And I think that was great. And I think you should tell the audience. I think they'd enjoy that. So Disney's brilliant uh, Cinderella. She was a girl who sat on the steps brushing them and singing, Oh, poor me, I, this is an awful life. And and the birds were around her and the squirrels and the deer because nobody else would listen to that. And then she goes over to the well, which we all know is a wishing well, and she says, uh, someday my prince will come. But she does nothing to make that happen. And then, because it's a fairy tale, the fairy godmother comes, and she says, what would you like? And she says, because she's really an immature person, a child, she says, I want to go to the party. So the fairy godmother, knowing that she's still a child, says yes, and she gives her a beautiful hairdo and a beautiful dress and lets her go with what would today be a limousine. And 
she gives her a curfew <laughs> because she's a kid. <laughs> And there's Cinderella dancing with the prince because she looks so beautiful. And that's the story we're told as children, that if you look beautiful, the prince will automatically come. And this is a fairly vacuous prince. And there he is, being attracted only by her beauty, or so we see. And um, she doesn't say what her name is and where she's from, nor does he ask. And then, you know, the children who watch this tales. The clock strikes 10, the clock strikes 11. We all know 12 is coming, <laughs> but she doesn't pay attention because she's a child. Right. And suddenly she runs down the stairs and loses her shoe, and he has to go and find her, not knowing her now, not knowing where she comes from. Well, he does know she comes from the town. And now we're going to fast forward to when he goes around trying, or his henchmen go around trying to find this beautiful girl who will fit the glass slipper that she left on, conveniently left on the staircase. It was originally a, a rapid foot shoe, which, could, which was worn at special occasions because it was very fragile and therefore it was expensive in, a, in that way. And you turned it inside out, so your foot rubbed the that rabbit's fur and because of that, really only one person would fit that foot. Wow, print. that's so interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. I can use that now. My feet are always hurt. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I don't know what makes them now, but you can. And in my size, I'm not sure. About it. <laughs> so he, she, he, she has uh, been locked up in the closet and told not to come down. And uh, nobody could fit into the shoe, of course. And then finally, there is this moment when she becomes an adult and she says, I deserve this. Wow, that's amazing. And that makes her not care about how she looks, not care what her hair is like or her makeup is like or the dress she's wearing. That makes her understand that she as a human being is okay. Of course, when we tell this fairy tale to our children, that part gets left out. Somehow it's a miracle that she runs down. She has a little bit of courage. But it's really this adulthood that she reaches. And that's the same thing with plastic surgery or anything like that. It's nice to have the outfit, and you do fit in, and you very well might attract someone who's wonderful, you know, or might be a vacuous prince. He was always running after women in distress. Damsels in distress, the prince? Yeah, that's yeah. the same. And um, and even though we dress up and we have fun with it, it's really not going to make us feel like mature, acceptable people until we feel that. So when you said, what, what, what does that do? Well, it helps us prepare for that next step. That's why teenagers are so really wrapped up in how they look. And they try on different outfits depending on the group they want to be with. And it's wonderful to watch them, but it's so important to fit in, to fit in, to fit in until you reach adulthood and you say, no, I don't have to fit in, I just have to be me. But not everybody can be me and feel good about who they are. And a lot of people don't know who they are. They could be in relationships that have um, been, I guess, putting them down and out. Mm -hmm. um, they could be in a relationship that they feel that they're incompetent or doesn't make them feel good. I have friends and family that I know have been in relationships where the women, you know, their self-esteem went so far down so fast. Um, being told you're not good, you don't look pretty, you're mm -hmm. fat, you're ugly, um, go see your doctor. Maybe a doctor can help you. Maybe, you know, we're not having good sex because, you know, there's something wrong with you. So as women growing up, it was very important that we try to be as perfect as we can, always look pretty. My mom to this day at the wedding last weekend or this past weekend, smile, be pretty, make sure your lipstick is on, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, and that's very typical, not only of a Jewish mother, but it's very typical of a mother, you know. Um, or not all mothers. I was actually raised by a very different mother who wore her hair in a ponytail when everyone had it teased up and and didn't wear a bra when she really should have. And <laughs> so I didn't get that message at home, but most people do. Right. And we get it from the whole culture too. I mean, we talked about one of your amazing trips and how you came back from this trip and you were in the supermarket and saw all these magazines. I mean, that alone, you know, 
kind of is enlightening to see what we're reading and what we're seeing. That actually was more than kind of enlightening. That was a very powerful moment in my life. I had come back from being with tribes where there was no running water, no electricity. I did, you, you couldn't wash. Where was that? It was New Guinea. Okay. In the Asma region, which is essentially mud. They, they don't even live in the Stone Age. It's mud. Wow. And they would get their stone axes by trading with the people in the highlands. But it was very, very what we would call primitive. And it didn't matter how you looked. And, and there the men get more dressed up than the women. And they, they wear things that denote that they've killed someone or they've achieved something in the group. Um, the women, not so much. Uh, but I really was not concerned with the way I looked. And, and it was dark. It was a swamp. And then we came back and here's this, the stimulation and the light in the supermarket about how to get food. And as I'm walking to check out, the, on both sides of the aisle, not accidentally, are all these magazines to appeal to women and appeal to women's insecurities. That's so true. you don't smell good, you don't look good, you're not wearing the right clothes, you're not wearing the right hairdo, you're not speaking well, you're not behaving well in bed, you're certainly not the right weight, and here's the best recipe for a cake. And, and all of this was really just, just startling to me and very, very important for me because I realized what the pressure was in the society and how much I certainly am, and everyone else is affected by it. It helped me not be so affected by it. It was a very powerful moment for me. Now, what, what, I mean, you deal with men and women and couples and issues. What advice do you have for people about how to look at the mirror, look at yourself, not only from the outside, but from the inside, and how to feel better about yourself? What would be your advice to a patient or to a friend um, that is, you know, not feeling very good about themselves. It takes a lot of work to go from not feeling good about yourself to feeling good about yourself. Some people do it spiritually, some people do it in therapy, but you have to do it in some way. And it's part of going from being a person to being a mature person. Uh, you know, I, I have that thing that was written by my mother-in-law. Um, let's, let's pull it down. Can you? Okay. And you can continue talking while I grab it. So. It's very important to look inside and know that the mirror is only reflecting your outside. And most of us do know that. And some of us pretend that if we fix the outside, then we're gonna feel better inside. And sometimes we will feel better. We will never feel good if there's that empty space inside. And that's, that's where the work comes in. This is actually an interesting photograph. Yes, um, this is my mother-in-law who's 93 now and my uh, three grandchildren, her great grandchildren. We have a new grand great grandchild for her. Uh, this was uh, taken at my house for Passover maybe two years ago. And so Laura's going to read something that we talked about um, that she had written. And this was a gift to Laura. Um, and it's a framed letter that Laura is going to read to you that has a lot of meaning. Actually, she wrote this to read for her 90th birthday party when she read it out loud, <laughs> and I still am touched when I say it, even the waiters were crying, it was so wow. powerful. I can't wait to hear it, you know, I've heard so much about it. <laughs> she said, recently I was asked how I felt about being old. I was taken aback for I do not think of myself as old. I explained that it was an interesting question and I would ponder it and let him know. Growing older, I decided, is a gift. I am now the person I always wanted to be. It's amazing. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder who that person is that lives in my mirror. I don't agonize over those things for long. I would never trade my amazing friends or my loving family for less gray hair or a flatter belly. As I've aged, I've become more kind to myself and less critical of myself. I've become my own friend. I don't chide myself for eating that extra cookie <laughs> or for not making my bed. <laughs> I'm entitled to smell the flowers. I've seen too many dear people leave the world too soon before they understood the great freedom that comes with age. Whose business is it if I choose to read or watch TV until 4 a.m.? Sure, over the years, my heart has been broken. How can your heart not break? 
<laughs> when you re re lose a, a loved one. It is. It's very emotional. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm so blessed to have lived long enough to have my hair turn gray <laughs> and to have my youthful laughs be forever etched in my grooves in my face. I can say yes and mean it. I can say no and mean it. <clears throat> As you get older, it's easier to be positive. You care less about what other people think. I've earned the right to be wrong. <laughs> so to answer your question, I like being older. It has set me free. I like the person I've become. I'm not going to live forever. <clears throat> but while I'm still here, I will not waste time lamenting what could have been or worrying what, white, what will be. And if I want to, <clears throat> and she does, <laughs> I shall eat dessert every single day. I wish you a day of, of ordinary miracles. Live simply, love generously, care deeply, speak kindly, <laughs> and leave the rest to God. <laughs> it's lovely. Isn't that it? is really, it's beyond what you told me. And it does have so much meaning. It's really, I mean, I don't want to ruin my makeup. <laughs> we are on Facebook Live. But I will make a copy of this because this is amazing. I mean, she should have been a writer. I mean, she's an amazing woman. And I know today at 93, yeah. how she had a conversation with you last night, and she is... Sharp as a tech. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's a, you know, it's another thing that brings us back around into this industry is, you know, people are living longer. We want to look better. Mm -hmm. Early, we talked about if you're in sales and you're out there, you have to look better because the pressure is on. Yes, there is a discrimination against aging. And, you know, so in our world of aesthetics and wellness and beauty, we have to kind of tie in together aging gracefully mm -hmm. and looking good and feeling good. What would be your um, your words of wisdom to people who really want to look in the mirror and feel better about themselves and, you know, um, fairy tale, not fairy tale, you know, how would somebody start on this on this path to just, you know, maybe there'll be a sentence or something they write and look at every day. Maybe there'll be some spiritual, and I know you're very spiritual in a lot of ways, which is very interesting, um, and you've traveled the world, so you've seen a lot. So just give us some, you know, final words of advice coming from somebody um, who talks to so many men, women, and couples who are unhappy, who want happiness in their lives. Um, what direction or what can you, what can you tell them? I mean, I, you know, I don't know. You know, it's easier to say, well, happiness comes from it and it does. And it's also easy to say, well, you have to look good and you mm -hmm. do. And all of that is true. If you don't feel good inside, then you have to do the work there. And again, it's either spiritual or in therapy or in some way work on that. And if it's not, if it's on the outside and you don't feel right. good about that, work on that. However, if you only work on the outside, it's a waste of time. Well, and I, I definitely understand that. I mean, our industry is very focused on the way you look now and today. And, you know, the people who work in our environment are all young and pretty or sexy. They all have to look the part. Um, one thing I did want to tie back into this to end the conversation um, was also we talked um, over the last year multiple times about vaginal rejuvenation mm -hmm. and how there are options that are non-surgical out there. I know they know me as a thermi queen because <laughs> I kind of launched, I know it's very funny, um, but how we yes, launched... Yes, this is all new information for me. It's <laughs> not in my field. <laughs> But, you know, but bringing it into your field, like we're bringing it into the GYN market, mm -hmm. um, you know, vaginal rejuvenation and um, having, feeling better about yourself as a woman. And now there's, um, there's things for men, obviously, you know, men have medication they could take, there are injections for men, there are lots of things out there. But a lot of women take it personally that, you know, if they can have good sex or they have incontinence and they have issues um, and how it's affecting them as a couple. And then the men are taking it, as we talked about personally, that maybe they're not, you know, doing something right. So how do you see this non-invasive, non-surgical um, alternative for women to change around their lives to feel better about themselves, you know, internally and sexually um, as an individual and as a couple? Sexuality is so important in a marriage. 
if both people have a good libido, that's great. If both people have low libidos, that's fine too. It's when one has a high libido and one has a low libido, you've got a little problem. But then when, or a big problem, then